Ellen P. Reese. Education is by definition successful. The only measure of a teacher's success is the student's success. This is not a, play, a paid placement for the Daily BA, but it is a plug. It's got some pretty cool posters. I want to mix them up. Although they don't stick to your walls very damn well, which is why we have to put them up every week. But this week, not going to happen because we've habituated to them being on the wall, <laughs> which is relevant given the article for today. <laughs> My tiny notepad. All right, so here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> he didn't know it was... I'm doing my thing. Thank you. All right, you, you do your thing, it. I'll I do mine. All right, we will all do our things. All right. Dynamic changes in reinforcer effectiveness. Sati wow. Satiation and habituation have different implications for theory and practice. Dr. Francis K. McSweeney, Washington State University. Skinner's last student. Amazing advisor. So, oh, oh awesome lady. Uh, got the lucky opportunity to uh, spend a little bit of time in her lab and have her as a professor. And she was on my master's committee, thesis committee, and my dissertation uh, committee. And uh, wow, she's cool. Um, so, I, I didn't pick this article, and Brad didn't pick this article simply because it was from uh, Dr. McSweeney. It, we picked it because it's hyper relevant to everything that we do as behavior analysts and <clears throat> for reasons that there's an article written about which we might get into later class ceiling um it hasn't been adopted widespread however this article probably should be so the, the point of this article is that we tend to see that there's some language issues in our field, all right? And Skinner talked about these language issues, um, how we need to operationally define everything and blah, 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 and the value of that and so on and so forth. But um, there's, Skinner himself identified a, um, a problem with reinforcers, how they don't have a consistent effect on behavior. Um, others have identified it as well. It's not new to Skinner. It was, a, a, I mean, Skinner talked about it. Um, others have talked about it as well. It doesn't matter how many people we want to cover here, but just know that, up until the McSweeney series of articles, um, it was often referred to as how you satiate to a reinforcer. But that's complete hogwash. There may be some reinforcers to which you do satiate under certain times. Maybe if I'm full of drinking liquid. Crystal light is amazing. Um, if I'm full of drinking liquid, it's entirely possible that I could satiate to that liquid. Um, but what about money? Do you satiate to money? I don't know. Interesting question. So, Fran... I don't uh, have enough money to eat. I don't, have, I don't even want to go there. Like, the brain's not ready for that sort of thing. <laughs> I don't have enough money to eat. Generalized condition reinforcers. All right. So, no. All right. Uh, so, uh, Fran opens... And I will refer to Francis K. McSweeney as Fran because I know her personally. So, um, Dr. McSweeney, Fran, she talks about how the terms have... Um, have power in their own right. So whether or not you talk about the changes in reinforcer effectiveness over a particular session as being due to satiation or being due to habituation, it's actually an important distinction to choose the word properly. Why? Well, why? Because our science does not stand alone independent of other sciences. There are other fields that study satiation. There are other fields that study habituation. Habituation is an extremely well-known process. Um, maybe if we stick to terms and define them well, we can achieve more quickly that consilient stuff that we've talked about in some other behaviors, the merging of, uh, of sciences. And if our definitions match other definitions in other branches of science, then it's easier to understand what we're all talking about. And we keep this consistent language across the board. And one of the things that I think Fran talks about, and not I think, I know she talks about it, is that we didn't do that in our field. We chose the term satiation to mean any time that a reinforcer loses effectiveness. <laughs> There's so much to like go into here. <laughs> um, 
you're thinking motivation operate motivating operations you're thinking all that stuff and good that's what you should be thinking and the point being that it's probably not satiation it's probably actually habituation so this is a long article and there's a whole bunch of articles that are presented um, on this topic and i find it interesting that it had to be presented this way but uh fran literally has four, four pages one yeah, four pages of references in this article. And it starts out that this is not an experiment. This is a summary of what uh, what has gone on in the habituation literature and understanding how we change in response to um, stimuli, or as how, we, how, we, how we change our responses um, to reinforcers and how much behavior they quote unquote hold, so to speak. So, all right. Without going into every gross detail, there is um, a couple of very clear patterns that happen with reinforcers. Um, when, you del when you break these down into the rate of operant responding um, per unit of time, right? So time units over a session. So a session is typically under an hour, right about an hour, 50 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there, depending on which study you're looking at. Um, so the rate of reinforcement that you provide produces different patterns of responding within that, that time frame. Um, so if you have a sort of rate that's kind of middle of the road, um, what was it? The three response. So, um, so if you if you respond if you produce reinforcers at a low rate, then it, then the rate of responding increases. If you produce them at a high rate, the rate of responding decreases. If you find a middle of the middle middle ground, so to speak, in there, um, the the behavior goes up, and so the proportion of responding goes up, and then it it drops down. Basically, it follows classic extinction curves or habituation curves, if you will. So. Um, in other words, the effectiveness of a reinforcer changes depending on how frequently you provide it within a particular session. It's really that simple. Um, and you, I've already said you're jumping into MOs and you should, and you should think about that stuff, okay? So overwhelming evidence are, um, across multiple species um, basically argues that the changes in and response patterns with regard to the reinforcer presentation within a session is due to habituation and um, sensitization and not satiation. Whew. That's a heavy mouthful. Um, this article goes into the 13 different categories of or, or characteristics of habituation. I'm not going to go through them all, but they're all right there. Um, so there's 13 different characteristics. Um, Franz Lamb has done verified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven of those. Eleven of those. Any particular context of in the particular context of reinforcers being delivered within a particular session, right? Um, across multiple species, from rats to pea rats to um, I think there was there's other species in there including humans all right so and that was kind of cool um the human stuff let's see what other, what other notes do i have what does this mean for extinction multiple schedules no not contingent there's just so much to talk about here um so ultimately it's really simple the longer you go within a session as long as you're using the same reinforcer that reinforcer has less is less effective over time in other words it doesn't hold as much behavior right so by the time you get towards the end of a session Right? That reinforcer is losing its effectiveness. What implication does that have for extinction? What implication does that have for multiple schedules of reinforcement? Think about how we respond to reinforcers. And one of the one of the things that they talked about in here was that we describe an organism as being satiated on that reinforcer, but it's not. That's a, it has to do with a food consumption thing. Right? How about smelling foods? Because that was one of these criteria. Right? So humans smelling hamburgers and tasting hamburgers and getting access to hamburgers and then switching it up and switching it to, I think it was apple pie, if I recall correctly, um, or something to that effect. And the behavior basically jumping right back. This article is brilliant in the fact that it summarizes all of the research that argues on behalf that habituation is an actual thing that you could habituate to reinforce. So, um, not contingent reinforcer delivery. Oh, side note, whoop, little beep here. I love the fact that Fran talked about non-contingent reinforcer delivery. Because non-contingent reinforcement is a bunch of BS, but you can deliver reinforcers non-contingently. Uh, 
because reinforcement by definition requires the contingent piece, right? Um, so Fran chooses her language very carefully, just like Skinner did. And I think it's important to note some of those things uh, when you're out there. That sometimes we use language that's a little bit more loosey goosey than what it implies, than what the literature implies. Uh, wheel running. Uh, we've seen this stuff in wheel running, exercise, right? Habituation to wheel running, to running. Well, drug consumption. It, it, I, there's so much in here. Like I could spend the next two days talking about it, and I probably will. So, um, anyway, beside the point. Take a look at the article. Read through it. Understand that you do habituate to reinforcers. Um, at least that's Fran's argument. Uh, and she has a lot of solid evidence to back it up. And uh, that the reinforcers basically lose their effectiveness within a particular session. So, And it does look like somebody in the room has something to say. So I'm going to relinquish my seat. <clears throat> No, you and pass right it up. What? Right oh, right oh, oh my gosh. I don't know what's going on. Ah, so you're telling me someone engaged in a task for a long period of time, yes. earning a particular reward, say, work in the shop. Right? Click, click. Yes. Yeah. All right, sure. We've made how many videos throughout Psychor? Oh, good lord. Eight, almost 800 now. Oh, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800 videos. videos. Yes. Exactly. So you're telling me we've done that many videos, that many books, that many hours, and that nail gun is... Still reinforcing? You so. notice he was presented with the nail gun and didn't continue lecturing and just put it down. <laughs> so I would say no. And you can't eat a nail gun. At least you shouldn't eat a nail gun because I'd be worried about all the implications of that. That would be um, pica. That would be pica, yes. uh, which we don't. I I hope they habituate quickly. Um, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, that would be good. But yeah. my point is, uh, habituation's a thing. Uh, you get kids engaged in activities, adults engaged in activities where it becomes no longer meaningful. And when you run into that, mix up your reinforcers. And you'll notice your non-compliant bits and your ability to run longer sessions and more trials of whatever skill you're working on. You can even do stuff like this, folks. There's one of the studies talks about this. Do something along these lines. Oh, hold on, let me do some more. So it's salient. Yeah. All right. I'm sure you can see it in the video. But the idea is, change it up. A dishabituation, a dishabituation stimulus, right? And then all of a sudden the behavior comes right back. When you switch everything off and switch it back on, boop, behavior comes right back. This is one of the studies that they've done, a series of studies that they've done. It's, it's overwhelmingly cool to see what happens when you actually start to understand that you habituate to reinforcers and you program around that. Like, hello, use your evidence. Um, and one last point that I'd like to make that I don't know if Brad wants to make as well, but this is EAB. And it does connect immediately to the applied world. Just because this study was done on a handful of species, or these studies were done on a handful of species, and it was done in a highly controlled laboratory, doesn't mean it's not valuable. In fact, if you read this, they talk about all of that stuff and the value of applying this in, 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 in the real world. <laughs> EAB connects, folks. It does. It really, really. No works. way. Yes. Rats are a thing. What? Ah! Well, ah! Not just rats. No, it's People are also. rats. Yeah. Yeah, experimental analysis of behavior, folks. There's a reason that uh, we like to look at it and study it and listen to it because it does have value uh, for the applied world. So That's habituation for you. I go. Habituation reinforcers. One of the oldest known learning processes across so many species. One of the most basic learning but processes. natural level, so you keep talking. I'll keep talking forever and about this is a hot topic. And I love the fact that there's... Listen to all these articles. McSweeney, 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 McSweeney. McSweeney, 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 McSweeney,